Hi everybody. Uh, this lecture is going to be about critical thinking and what it means to think critically. Critical thinking is kind of a buzzword in um, higher education. It's usually a general education competency or you know pillar of most universities. And uh, you'll often hear people talking about critical thinking and all these things. Um, but a lot of people don't know how to define it. Uh, and so when you even ask like your professor what they think critical thinking is, they might say something that's really ambiguous or um, that doesn't really help you out in terms of uh, what it actually means um, or how it's practiced. And, and of course critical thinking means different things in different fields. But because this is a philosophy course and because critical thinking has been well defined in philosophy, um, we're going to use a very specific set of definitions. Um, one comes from Paul and Elder, and it says that critical thinking is thinking about thinking in order to improve thinking. There seem to be a couple approaches to critical thinking within the realm of philosophy. One is the Paul and Elder method, and what they do, and you can check out their um, community of critical thinking website online, it's a good one. What they do is they, they ask students to do a lot of metacognitive analysis of their own beliefs. So what that means is they ask students and others to think about their thinking and think about why they believe the things that they believe or why they do the things that they do. Um, and they outline a series of intellectual virtues that they believe will enhance thinking. And then for, for, for Paul and Elder and others in, in that vein, critical thinking is, um, is a set of skills that you can use to evaluate uh, various types of problems in your life. So. If you have these certain skills, the skills are what's important, not, for example, content knowledge. Because if you can, for example, ask the right types of questions in any circumstance, then um, you'll ultimately probably come to better answers, no matter what the field is or no matter what kind of situation you're in. And then there seems to be another approach to critical thinking that, that is also aligned with kind of the Paul and Elder mode, <clears throat> but it, it's more formalized. Um, logic. So with, with the other approach, not only do you talk about all those things, you, um, you learn about arguments and how to parse arguments to separate them into, into different component parts. You learn how to analyze them, uh, deductive arguments in terms of validity and soundness, and inductive arguments in terms of strength and weakness. Uh, and then there are you know, sections on how to interpret scientific data. There are sections on how to make um, inductive generalizations properly. There are sections on informal logical fallacies. And then some of the critical thinking texts actually go into formal logic, where you then use Venn diagrams to analyze uh, validity of arguments. And even so far, I've seen as to do some, um, some minimal propositional logic where you're symbolizing statements and then figuring out using rules uh, whether or not uh, those, those arguments are, are valid or invalid. But uh, I kind of like both uh, approaches. I think they're both important and, um, and I think each one does something uh, that can contribute to the overall thought of, of the thinker and enhance their critical thinking capabilities. Um, so another way to think about critical thinking is that it's a set of intellectual skills that can be used in multiple aspects of life. And I talked a little bit about this um, so if you have the skills that you can use to ask questions properly, to question your own assumptions and prejudices, to objectively outline multiple positions on an issue, and then align yourself with the one that has the most evidence, then you can apply those skills at work, you can apply those skills in your family, you can apply those uh, skills uh, just when you're out in society. 
um, when you're thinking about anything, when you're thinking about buying a car, a house, how to distribute your resources, how to use those resources, you can use these skills to make good decisions. And um, another key question, it's a simple question, and it's one that that we've all thought of, but perhaps we haven't thought of it um, properly, is, um, is this decision going to make my life better? Now, going along with Aristotle, we could say that every decision that somebody makes, they make because that they believe it will ultimately bring about a good in their life. So even, for example, the, the person who kidnaps a child sees their life as being better um, in kidnapping that child than in not kidnapping that child. Um, now, is that an ultimately better life in terms of ethics? Most of us would say, no, it's not a better life. But for that person, what they're saying in doing that act or, for example, the person that cuts themselves. What they're saying is that in cutting myself, my life is better um, than it would be if I didn't cut myself. Now, of course, there are all different types of psychological motivations. So somebody cutting themselves might think, oh, I wish I weren't doing this to myself. But from this kind of ancient perspective, you know, it's the idea that, no, even though you might think that in your head, um, really your actions display how you really feel about existence. So what you're saying is that this is my best form of life or those things. But I want to talk about uh, better in terms of more flourishing, as Aristotle does, right? Um, so he distinguishes between a good and the good. Um, and, we, and I want to do that as well. So what I mean by better is something that makes your life better in the sense of more flourishing. Are you happier? Are it, does it contribute to your overall well-being? Does it contribute, does the decision contribute to the overall, overall well-being of people that you care about? Um, does it lead to positive outcomes monetarily? But meaning like you're, you're, you're gaining resources that you need, but you're not doing it in such a way that you feel badly about the way that you did it. There's nothing better than to make money doing something that you know is not harming anyone else, I guess you could say. And a lot of us, probably have been in situations where we do something and then we second guess why we're doing it. I mean, we're doing it, of course, because we need money or resources. But you know, you have those issues. It's like, should I be working for this company or should I be working in this way? Because uh, what if it's, I mean, I'm having to do things that go against what I believe to be a better life. But this is the question that we should start with every time we're gonna make a decision to be a critical thinker. Is this decision gonna make my life better or the lives better of people that I care about. Now, of course, like you have the example, like the Jason Statham example, right? Like, um, uh, I'm gonna kill this guy because he wants to kill my family and therefore I'm gonna make their life better. Okay, like, let's eliminate those types of examples. <clears throat> um, all those, although those are interesting philosophically, um, let's just think of like everyday examples and let's just use kind of a folk wisdom understanding of better. So like, um, let's say you're going to buy a TV screen that pops out in your car, right? You should think, well, is this decision going to make my life better? Let's say it's going to cost you $700. Do you need a TV screen in your car? Probably not. Um, is it ultimately going to make your life better? Could you use that $700 in such a way that your life would be better? For example, let's say you have $700 in credit card bills that you could use that $700 for. Or you, you have the TV screen that pops out in your car. Well, let's say that the bills you keep getting are making your life very uh, anxiety filled, right? You know, oh, another bill, ah. Well, if you pay off the bills, probably overall your life is gonna be better because then you won't have that, that continuous anxiety. So it's probably best to maybe pay off those bills than to buy the TV screen that pops out in your car. Maybe it's best to save the money and just wait for something that you actually need or sit on, sit on it. Um, you know, maybe you're gonna come across a hard couple weeks where you don't have much money and having that little egg will help you get through that hard time. You know, there, just because you have money doesn't mean that you should spend it, right? We, we live in a society that tells us like, the whole market is based on people buying products, right? It's like, uh, if people start saving money, 
then the economy suffers because by the economy, meaning like businesses suffer because they, they're not selling as much, right? So it kind of harms the whole economy when people save all their money because they're not like buying things they don't need, right? Um, and so thinking outside of those distinctions, um, it's always a smart move to save your money. It's, it's pretty much always a smart move to never buy anything that you don't need. And what do we really need? You know, we really need clothing, but we don't need clothing that costs thousands of dollars. We need food, most of us would say three meals a day, but we probably could do fine on two. Um, and then, you know, lodging, but we don't need huge multi-million dollar houses. Um, we probably don't even need more than two bedrooms, even with a family of four. Um, but anyway, is this decision going to make my life better? In thinking about all the decisions you make every day, um, or the things that are on your plate or that you're approaching, Think about this question. This is a great place to start in critical thinking. But there are a series of other skills that critical thinkers practice. And that's what I'm going to talk about right now. So one thing that critical thinkers do is they state problems as clearly as possible. So they state problems as clearly as possible. And I'm just kind of stepping out so that you can see the whole thing. One thing, another thing that critical thinkers recognize is that problems are not simplistic. Black and white distinctions only exist in math. And, um, and even in probably higher levels of math, they don't even exist, right? Um, it's really, critical thinkers understand that problems are um, multiplicitous. They're these gnarled knots that are hard to undo, um, that have multiple aspects that come in from different um, angles. And so to say something as clearly as possible doesn't mean that you're going to state it absolutely perfectly, but you do your best to state it in such a way um, that others can understand it. Critical thinkers also um, create answers to problems that are realistic. Perhaps you've heard of the big idea person, right? And this person at work or whatever is always coming up with these great, huge uh, ideas, right? Um, you know, like, let's create a flying car, or, um, you know, I bet time travel actually is possible. Now, of course, there might be some people who can actually do that. Um, but sometimes creating big answers to unclearly stated problems does nothing but um, create more confusion. Sometimes there are no good answers. So what we have to do in those examples is to just choose the best possible worst answer. So for example, Rawls, a great political philosopher, said that in a society, you ought to distribute wealth and resources such that, not such that some people have a million dollars and some people have a hundred, but that the best possible worst person um, is accounted for or is produced, the maximum principle. So in Rawls' society, a more just society would be one where people make $100,000, but the poorest make $50,000, than a society in which people can make a million, but the poorest have 100. So the best possible worst case scenario is what we often have to look for uh, and what critical thinkers are often really good at finding. Perhaps there, there is no perfect solution to any problem, except, you know, maybe like 2 plus 2 equals 4. Um, every other problem that we deal with every day might not have a good solution, but instead of getting frustrated that there is no perfect solution, critical thinkers are able to maximize the worst possible solution. They're willing to try things and improve on those things rather than try to make everything perfect initially, only to not even get started. Okay, let's continue. What's another thing that critical thinkers do? Critical thinkers attempt to be objective with evidence and argumentation. Critical thinkers Attempt to be objective with evidence and argumentation. 
Look, I'm making an imperfect video right now because my marker is running out, so I am walking to get another one. So people who really care about things running smoothly in a video will not like my video. But you know what? I don't care. Does that mean I'm a critical thinker? Maybe. Um, because what I care about is these ideas, not the video being pretty. Um, not that it's not important to care about aesthetics. So attempt to be objective with evidence and argumentation. Um, perhaps you've been in a conversation with a friend or colleague and you believe that you're being objective, but really you have your position and you do everything you can just to prove that you're right. And you interpret all the evidence for the opposite side through the lens of some sort of like negative filter. Um, for example, you say, well, that, that's only true if you believe this, but really it's not true because what you're doing is this or that. So you, you um, Paul and Elder called it sophistic uh, objectivity. You pretend to be objective, you go do all this research, but really you're not open to all the possibilities. What you're doing in your research is trying to find reasons that, that counter the position that you already despise, right? And this is what we see on the news all the time, the Fox News uh, versus the MSNBC, or I don't even know, that distinction, right? It's like everything on Fox News is filtered through Democrats are bad. Everything on the opposite side, opposite side is filtered through Republicans are bad. Therefore, anything that a Republican does is wrong. Anything a Democrat does is wrong. Anything a Democrat does well, I'm going to critique it through the lens of actually Republicans made it possible for the Democrat to do it well, blah, blah, blah. Meanwhile, it's like, what's the difference between Republicans and Democrats? Not much, but everybody thinks there is, right? Um, what about other ideas, like even further this way or even further this way or in the middle, right? They're lost because, um, because we don't really want pure freedom. Uh, we don't want to choose between extremes or find the best possible solution to each issue. We want somebody to, to tell us everything we believe over here and everything we believe over here. I'm going to line over here. I'm going to line over here. You're wrong. You're wrong. Well, anyway, critical thinkers are attempt to be objective and listen to evidence and argumentation. And instead of making the other side appear weak or simple-minded, they're willing to say, look, I understand. Um, let's take abortion, for example, right? Um, you know, it's like one, there's some people who are extreme, like, yeah, abortion all the time uh, in all cases. And the other side's like, abortion never. And now we're finally starting to see people who say, um, yeah, uh, abortion and rape and molestation cases and all this stuff. Um, that's okay. So that's kind of a middle position. Um, but it, it's pretty obvious that in a perfect world, um, no woman would have to go through that process, right? So that seems to indicate that there's something negative about it, whether it's the physical uh, trauma that happens or the emotional trauma that happens to these to these women. In a perfect world, that would not happen, right? But on the other side, um, it, you know, uh, it, it's almost like there's no willingness to allow women to make a choice um, to do these things. And for some reason, people can't just realize that there has to be some sort of like balance between the two. Um, if there's not, I mean, everybody recognizes that it's not a fun thing to go through an abortion and then it, it causes harm in some way, uh, either to the woman or to the fetus or whatever you believe. Um, but on the opposite side, it's pretty evident that like if it weren't a possibility that there would be a lot of other negative outcomes that would arise from it, uh, from not providing abortions, right? So, you know, critical thinkers try to maintain objectivity uh, and admit the strengths and weaknesses of each side. Of, cor of course, I believe in women's rights. Um, uh, but at the same time, I recognize that that is, that is not a procedure that would exist in a perfect world. Um, and I'm not saying that you have to take my position, but, but I think that I'm displaying a little bit of objectivity in the middle here and kind of hovering in this middle ground um, about it. But I'll leave, because that's a, that's a hard issue, but I'll leave it at that. Um, okay, next point. Um, Oh, critical thinkers change courses of action.
Critical thinkers are willing to change uh, their course of action. So what that means is I like to exemplify this by like the horror film, right? Um, it's like like four teenagers out in the woods and they're like, let's go into this ha this little cabin, you know, with the doors hanging off. And everybody's like, yeah, let's go. Let's go into this little cabin. Oh, look, there's a stairwell that goes into hell. Let's go down there and see what's down there, right? And they're like, yeah, let's go down there. And so they go down the stairwell and then all of a sudden the first one, like a knife comes out and chops their head off, right? And blood flies everywhere. And the other three are like, well, we've come this far. We might as well keep going, right? Um, so then they go down there and then like a huge rat jumps out and like bites the guy. And he's like, ah, and then the other people, instead of running back, of course, they keep running down the, we've gone this far, let's keep going, right? And ultimately it ends, you know, poorly for everyone. Uh, it ends with Leatherface doing the dance with the chainsaw. Um, which is still the freakiest thing ever. Best movie ever. But anyway, so uh, critical thinkers don't do that. If a critical thinker makes a decision and it becomes evident that that decision was not the right decision, a critical thinker is one who says, okay, look, I made the decision. First of all, the critical thinker will take responsibility for that decision. Look guys, I made a decision and I was wrong. It appears now that there's a better way. Um, so, and then the critical thinker will say, let's go down the better path. I'm really sorry we led us this far. I'm really sorry that Steven got his head chopped off. But you know what, at this point, we wanna keep all of our heads, so we're gonna you know, run back the other way and we're gonna to try to get out of here. And so being willing to change courses of action. I'm sure that um, many of you have been in situations where somebody um, is too strong-willed to admit that they're wrong. And so they continue to lead people down this path. And everybody behind them is like, but you know, like this path is leading to nowhere. But the person is like, no, I've chosen this path for all of us and we will all go down it. Um, that is not a form of critical uh, thought, especially when it's leading to negative outcomes, not only for yourself, but for those that you either work with or care about. So what do you do in that instance? You chop that person's head off and then you run with everybody else away. No, don't do that. Okay, what's another thing? Oh, critical thinkers know what interested parties are. Okay, an interested party is anyone who has anything to gain from your believing something that they want you to believe. Another, the easiest way to think about this is, let's imagine I am in uh, a jeans store. Um, I don't know if those exist, but it's just a store full of jeans, right? And, um, and the, per the people who work there, the only money they make is when they sell a pair of jeans to a customer. And, um, and they only have three types of jeans. So I choose the three types of jeans that are supposedly fit me and I come out and they look horrible. Like they don't fit right. Um, they're like falling off or something or they just don't look good at all, right? They it's just, it's not a good fit. What is the person gonna tell me when I come out of the, of the dressing room? They're probably not gonna say, hey look, all of these jeans look bad, really sorry. Thanks for coming to Jeans World. Um, but you might have some better luck down at um, the Gap or something, right? Um, they're not going to tell me that because they're an interested party. They have something to gain, money, from my belief that the jeans look good. So they're going to tell me, oh yeah, those jeans look good. You know, and the, the easiest way to do this, to think about this, is with um, people and businesses, right? Like car salesmen, right? It's like, oh, that's the car for you, trust me, you look good in that car. And you're like, yeah, I look good in this car, right? You know, like 2000 Civic, what? Um, with the cracked windshield, that's what I'm rolling in. But um, anyway, so interested parties are that way, but it, it doesn't just uh, align with business or with salesmen, right? And not all salesmen and women are, um, are people who are interested parties. Some only make an hourly wage and it doesn't, they'll tell you the truth because they're not gonna make any more or less based on um, if they sell you the product. Um, but there are other interested parties, like people who work for political campaigns. They're gonna 
tell you things about the opposite campaign that um, that sway the interest toward their party. Now, maybe one in a thousand will be absolutely objective and will say, look, here are the weaknesses of our party, here are the weaknesses of that party, um, and, they'll, and they'll be actually telling the truth. But in general, and for the most part, it's impossible for humans to be objective when they have something to gain uh, from somebody else doing or believing what they want them to do or believe. Um, so the next time that uh, you ask your partner, like, hey, where should we go for dinner? And they say, I don't care, you choose. And then you choose something and they're like, well, what about that, right? Um, you know, it's pretty obvious they want to go there. But, but they become an interested party, right? So they're going to try and convince you why your choice is wrong and theirs is right. And I'm not just saying that other people are that way. We are interested parties. Um, for example, we'll probably defend our jobs or the companies that we work for, no matter what, because we get resources from them. Or we might not defend them no matter what, but we might say, you know, we might view things from more of a positive perspective than somebody who is outside of our perspective. Um, if I have something to gain, let's say from um, the death of a loved one, right? Like let's say that somebody I care about is on their deathbed and I know that I'm in the running for their um, inheritance or something. Probably I'm going to like visit more, right, than I'd have over the past 30 years. I'm going to pretend that I care um, more than I have in the past. Um, now, of course, that doesn't always happen, but th that's what an interested party is. So always be aware of anybody who has anything to gain from your believing what they want you to believe. So when somebody comes up to you on the sidewalk and says, hey, you know, have you ever thought about this? You should believe this. You should believe that. You should be like, how much are they paying you? You know, like, what do you have to gain from telling me all this information, right? Um, okay, so critical thinkers know what interested parties are and they know how to react to them and protect themselves from them. One more thing, um, and then I'll probably do another video because I have a lot of bullet points here. Um, let's see, let's pick out another one. Critical thinkers maximize their time. And here I think of Camus. Um, Camus said the best life is the most living. Um, so that you need to like burn, and I, I kind of think of like Jack Kerouac or like Hemingway. Um, people who just, uh, they, they, have, they just want experiences. They want to live life. They want to try different things. They, you know, um, uh, Again, the best life is the one in which you have the most living. Uh, now, that's a debatable proposition, right? But at the same time, I, I like it here because I think it, it works well. Whatever you choose to do in your life, the things that, um, that you care about, remember from the first, the first few bullet points, the things that ultimately lead to your flourishing life, critical thinkers are really good at maximizing their time in relation to those things. So if what makes your life better is hanging out with your, your kids and your partner, um, and you're a critical thinker, then you're gonna figure out, there, usually the, that person would be really good at getting work done at work, uh, keeping work and home life separated, um, being proactive in terms of family events and things like that. They don't waste their time kind of alone in their room uh, doing meaningless activities. Um, if you are currently, which you probably are, a student, um, critical thinking students, uh, they don't study with the TV on. They do their best to perhaps put the kids to bed first before they study. Um, in their 15 minute break at work, instead of sitting and playing cards with their friends, they've got maybe their book and they read, read a few pages. Um, when they're in traffic, maybe they uh, have audio lectures and they're listening to their lectures instead of listening to the radio. So they figure out ways to maximize their time. They don't sit, go home and watch Everybody Loves Raymond. Now, of course, it's good to, to not just study all the time. We need some sort of relaxation. Um, but if you're having six hour you know, uh, everybody loves Raymond marathon sessions at home, uh, and then you're getting stressed out because you didn't do your homework, then you're probably not thinking critically about how to best utilize your time. 
Um, and so the final thing I guess I'll leave you with is that critical thinkers maximize their time in relation to the things that make their life more flourishing. Now, technically, I guess a critical thinker could maximize his or her time, and let's say they're a heroin addict, you know, they could get the money, and let's say that they're homeless or something, they can get their money as quickly as possible, they know where the dealer is, so they'll walk there and they get the, and then they know how to properly inject the heroin or however they take it. Um, but that, again, that doesn't maximize their time in relation to an ultimately flourishing life. So you can see how the different sets of skills kind of work together to reinforce each other. And if you don't have one, then probably the others will suffer. Um, so anyway, just keep thinking about the things that you care about and that you love and thinking about ways that you can maximize your time in relation to those things that you love because that's ultimately going to lead to your ultimately flourishing and happy life. Um, and so the next video will be uh, some more points about critical thinkers and the skills that they have that uh, enable them to, to, to flourish in multiple types of situations and environments.